Now on the APEC VIP hotline, cutting edge training for the serious athlete, APECGO.com. Joining us right now from the Dallas Morning News, David Moore. How are you doing, David? Great. How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thanks for coming on with us. I want to get your take on the state of the Dallas Cowboys now uh, at this halfway mark. Uh, do you see any hope for the future the rest of this season? Well, the, the hope is the schedule is, is much softer. Uh, they only play one team with a winning record the rest of the way. In fact, the combined record of the teams they face is 25-42, and 42, which is a winning percentage of 373. Uh, the other side of that is I'm sure a lot of those teams are looking at the Cowboys and saying, well, that's a game we can win because at 3-5, and five, I think their winning percentage is about 375. So uh, they're, they're dropping down in weight class, if you will, as far as who they face, and, and they should be have more success in the second half than they did in the first. Uh, but they've, they've dug themselves such a hole here, I'm, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to uh, dig out of it and, and seriously compete for a playoff spot. David, from your perspective, what do you see as being the main problem? Is it just a, a situation where they're just not good enough player-wise, talent-wise, or is it a scheme issue? What is it? Well, I, I would lean more toward the talent aspect of it, and I think uh, what you've seen in this first half is is what you often see with with bad teams. It's, it's a moving target on what needs to be fixed. Uh, I go back early in the year, you know, they had uh, – uh, after that Tampa Bay game, which they won, they had 13 penalties for 105 yards, and, and that was the second time in three games they've been penalized 13 times. And everyone's going, you've got to clean up these penalties. Uh, well, they only had two penalties for 10 yards in that next game, and Chicago smoked them. Um, you know, people were talking about how they had to establish and do something on the ground. Uh, then they ran for 227 yards in Baltimore and lost that game. And now going into this game, uh, the talk was they were coming off a six turnover performance and a loss to the Giants. And it was like, if you can just clean up the turnovers, uh, you're going to win these games. You just have to stop shooting yourselves in the foot. Well, they go into Atlanta, have no turnovers, and still lose that game. So it's, uh, you know, you spring a leak in one area, you fix it, and then something else comes up. And, and that, that really defines uh, teams that are unable to make the playoffs. That's what happens to them across the league. Uh, Rich Goslin, your colleague today, said uh, he wouldn't re-sign Tony Romo if it was up to him. What's your opinion on that? Well, I would say if you're not going to re-sign him, you better have a viable long-term option in place uh, because no team in this league wants to be in the position of having to play a uh, musical quarterback, if you will. Uh, the Cowboys went through that after losing Aikman uh, before they wound up with Romo. And that, I would argue, that was a more frustrating period uh, than what they're going through right now. So I just don't see that they have a viable option in place. So I don't know uh, that I could strongly argue that Tony Romo should not be resigned going forward. Now all this stuff about Sean Payton being available has added a, another distraction to this football team. Uh, I mean, there's no way that's going to happen, is there? I just don't see it, and, and you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds because, it, at least initially, uh, the way this is coming out kind of smacks of a negotiating maneuver ah. uh, because you have the, you know, you have this information come out on Sunday about, oh, now suddenly, um, look, you know, the, the league never approved this contract because of how it's written, which would make uh, Peyton, uh, Sean Payton a free agent at the end of this season. Now suddenly you have stories going that, okay, well, it just came out today, okay, even though that Peyton has no contact with the club on football matters this season, the league has said it's okay for them to discuss a contract. So, uh, you, you know, the, the way this is moving over the last few days, you just have to wonder, uh, it, was this really negotiating leverage to kind of get this out in public just so they could work on a deal and get it done uh, and not be excluded from talking until the end of the season. I mean, why would Sean Payton want to come into this dysfunctional mess anyway, if, even if he had the opportunity to come to Dallas? Well, and, and don't just, you know, he, he does have a very good relationship with Jerry Jones. Uh, he enjoyed his time here very much. He, you know, still has a home here. Uh, so all of those are factors for uh, and, and you do have the lure of the franchise, and uh, you know a lot of people. Even when this franchise is down, uh, they appreciate its history, and a lot of them think, you know what, 
they haven't had the success, but boy, I would be the one who would bring it back to them. So I don't think you can ever underestimate that lure uh, to head coaches out there. But you're right. Uh, there, there's more to it than that. There, there is uh, working out. Okay, just what are the lines of power, and who has final say, and and how involved are you going to be in my decisions? Um, there is the talent base you have in place versus others, and and if Sean Payton was on the open market, it it just wouldn't be Dallas uh, that you could draw a line to, and uh, uh, there would be a lot of other teams that would uh, be very very interested in him. All of this being said. I think when people start this conversation, they are greatly underestimating the faith that owner Jerry Jones has in Jason Garrett and the commitment that Jones has to Garrett and him making this work and him being the long-term coach here. Yeah, Jones is talking about uh, comparing him to Tom Landry and how long it took for Tom Landry to kind of get his feet on the ground as a head coach and to get the team going in the right direction. I mean, is that a valid comparison? I think it is. Temperamentally, uh, there are a lot of similarities there. Um, I think more so than any other coach in, in Cowboys history, uh, Jason Garrett aligns temperamentally as much with Tom Landry, more so than any other coach that they've had in place here. Um, you know, and Tom Landry, early in his tenure, there were, there were cries for him to be replaced as well. Uh, it's going to happen everywhere. Uh, you know, this is the, this is the, Certainly uh, the first time in Jason Garrett's short, brief tenure that this club has taken a step back. Uh, and he was talking yesterday about he still has faith that they're doing the right things, and, and faith is different than visual evidence. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, that they still feel they're, they put things in place that they're going to pay off here long term, and now it's, uh, it's time to, to work through this and, and uh, get to that spot. One of the things that Bill Parcells used to always talk about was churning the roster, constantly looking for players. And, and, and to me, that would seem to be something the Cowboys need to do because, uh, yes, the players out there in the open market right now are not good, but neither are the guys on this roster right now. Yeah, they and and they have. I, I think you've seen them bring in. Uh, you know, they probably signed six or seven different guys since the start of the season, which is, which is right in line with what uh, uh, Bill Parcells did. And while they haven't, you know, Bill Parcells kind of got into a pattern of every single Tuesday, the off day uh, at Valley Ranch, someone would be coming through to work out because he wanted to send a message to someone. While uh, Jason Garrett hasn't done it to that extent. Uh, you know, there was this time about two or three weeks ago where they had 15 players come through Pally Ranch on one day to work them out. And uh, while they don't do it every week, I would say it's it's unusual for them to go more than two weeks without bringing somebody in to work out. So uh, he's constantly looking to do that. And, and that's actually an area this team has done a pretty good job in over the last couple of years is uh, finding some some veteran free agents. Uh, once the season has started, who who can come in and make a contribution for them? Um, you know, one of them started this past game, Bernie Sims. He's only been here ten games and was starting against uh, Atlanta. Well, I'm thinking specifically of the offensive line because, I mean, again, Sunday night, third and one, they can't even get a push. And certainly there's got to be somebody out there in the open market right now just walking around looking for a job that can do that. Uh, and I'm just – I just can't – is there something a coach can do in the way of play calling to overcome a really bad offensive line? <laughs> well, I guess you probably don't call those plays, you know, those <laughs> running plays. I mean, I, I think you probably bite your lip and go, this group can't get the push I need, so let's go about it a different way. Let's go into a spread formation and try to uh, try to have our guy pick a hole that way rather than just lining up and, and going with power football. So I think these are things they're wrestling with on where they are in the running game. You know, I think they built their whole running game around DeMarco Murray being there. Uh, now that he's out, they don't have anyone who can do the things that he does, and I don't know that they've done a, a particularly good job of adapting to his absence. And one last thing, uh, there's some talk now and a lot of people suggesting that maybe the uh, Cowboys just need to turn Tony Romo loose, run a two-minute offense, and just let him get out there and improvise and run it that way because that seemed to be the only time the offense worked the other night against Atlanta. Well, you're, and you're going to have that argument, and uh, he had success doing that against New York as well. 
But I would point out that both of those times were desperate situations and the defense was playing the game differently. Uh, when he had success against the Giants, they were already up 23 nothing. in part because Tony Romo put him in that hole with the bad decisions he made early. So, you know, I, I think it's very rare that a coach is going to say, you know what, I'm just going to, let's break away from what we do and make everything uh, a night at the improv. Uh, I'm turning this over to you, Tony. Uh, we're going to go wherever you lead us. Uh, I don't think you're going to see that happen. And when you look at the fact that, that so far through eight games, Tony Romo has 13 interceptions and, yeah. and has lost two fumbles, uh, I don't know that you can make a strong argument based on you seeing this work a couple of times in games where this should be the bread and butter of the Cowboys' offense. Uh, it's it's uh, depressing, David, but we do appreciate your insights. Thanks very much for coming on with us. Sure thing. Thank you. Yes, sir. David Moore from the Dallas Morning News on Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM.